All right, today we are going to cover in our lessons is, is uh, 1020, the D series, the D module. But uh, this is also covered throughout the whole HVAC program, if you will. Anytime you're dealing with HVACR, the uh, test and balance is very important. That's what the subject is, test and balance. You know, can you imagine? I love to compare things to automobiles. Y'all know that. But can you imagine somebody designing and building an automobile and never trying it out to see if it would work right before they ever sold it or, or, or to the customer? Can, how well would that do? Not a good All right. Well, test and balance is just that. It's once the system is installed, then it should be tested and it should be balanced. Okay. Just like that automobile. Uh, it may run, but it may not stop. Okay, in this particular case, we may have a uh, the air side of the air conditioning may be never turn off. Well, that would show up in a test and balance. Okay, sometimes that's called commissioning. Also, you'll hear those terms; they're not the same. Commissioning and test and balance are not the same. But sometimes you'll hear that inter intertwined with one another. The bottom line is. We need instrumentation to do that. What testing and balancing is, is the point where it tells us whether the equipment is doing what it's supposed to do. If I have a five ton system, then I should be able to get five tons of air conditioning out of it. Not four and a half, not three, and it would be very unusual, but not five and a half. I should be able to get the five tons of air conditioning, okay? Your air flows have to be right. Now, we're going to limit our discussion here to basically air flows. But keep this in mind. Testing and balancing also includes uh, fluids such as water. You may actually have, of course, air. Air is a fluid, by the way. But you may actually have electrical current that may be checked. The electrical voltage may be test, uh, tested. All those things can, can involve in test and balance. But we're going to focus today strictly on the air side, okay? Well, we gotta know a little bit about air. And one thing that we need to know is that air at different temperatures is gonna take up a different amount of space. The volume is gonna change. So we've got to know temperatures. Now I have an infrared here that can t tell the surface temperature by switch of a button. Um, the problem about this is and it's not measuring air. It's measuring a solid. It's looking at the infrared that's coming back off of a solid. So in order to be able to measure air temperature, I need a device, simply a thermostat, or a thermal thermometer, excuse me. And this one is a bead type. So that's excellent for measuring air temperature. You can see the little bead right here at the end. And that does give them a temperature pass up. Okay. Well, air also contains moisture. So if I need to know the total heat content of a cubic foot of air, I can't just measure the temperature. I've also got to know the moisture content in it. Now, when we talk about the moisture content and the temperature there, the total heat content, that's called enthalpy. Is that correct? Did I say that correct? Yeah, enthalpy. That's close enough, Dave. <laughs> My pronunciation is not the best in the world, so y'all bear with me on this. And how can we measure that? Well, one way is through a sling supplementer. Okay, the sling supplementer has both a dry bulb, which is a regular thermometer, and a wet bulb, which is a regular thermometer with a wet sock on it. There's a little reservoir right here that holds water. By the way, the water needs to be at the room temperature, the temperature where you're measuring. You don't need to go get any hot water or cold water to put in there. You need to have um, uh, water that's close to the temperature that you're going to be measuring the air. Of. And you're looking at the evaporation rate, which causes a dip in the temperature. If you go back and you learn about the evaporation, it takes energy to cause it to evaporate. Well, that energy shows up as a decrease in the temperature. This 
would be slung like so. That's the reason they call it slings psychometry for about a minute. Okay. After about a minute, you would take and, uh, and read the wet bub first. In this particular case, and I didn't sling it that long, but I've got about 63 degrees wet bub and about 75 dry bub. Now, there's a chart that we can use called the psychometric chart that we can find out every property that we need to know about that, uh, that parcel of air. Y'all know what a parcel is? Yeah. Okay. Parcel could be anything from a 100,000 square cubic feet to this much. A parcel is any time you have a fluid that all those characteristics are the same or similar. Okay, if I had a parcel of air over here at 70 degrees and a parcel of air over here at 50 degrees, then I, I, they would measure different. They would have different characteristics. But it doesn't matter how much volume you got as long as it's all the, uh, the same characteristics. But anyway, we would be taking our psychometric chart, let me borrow yours here for just a moment, and we would be looking at the dry bub temperature, which is across the bottom, and the wet bub temperature, which is on this curve right here, and comparing the two to come together to find out what our relative humidity is. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on this, but it is in your book. And once you, once you learn the different lines on here, it's a very easy chart to understand. If you look at it and just go like that, it's like, whoa. But you've got to break it down line by line by line. But you can tell exactly how much moisture is in that air, either through relative humidity or grains of moisture. <coughs> grains of moisture is really the best way to measure the amount of moisture. And the reason being is because relative humidity is just that. It's relative to the amount of moisture that can be held in a, in, a, in a parcel of air at a certain temperature, and that changes with the temperature. Okay? Uh, if you want to see what the true amount of moisture is, then the grains of moisture, it takes 7,000 grains of moisture to make one pound of, uh, uh, of water. So we can measure that, and that doesn't change. Okay? I mean, that's it's always going to be the same. It's not like relative humidity. All right. So that's, a, that's just a little bit of, of uh, background on some of the things that we're going to need to know. Another thing that we're going to have to understand is how to measure cubic feet. Well, cubic feet, first of all, one square foot is equal to 144 square inches. That's 12 by 12. You multiply the 12 by 12, you get 144. 144 square inches is equal to one square foot. If I have one foot of a fluid, in this case air, to go past that one square foot, that's one cubic foot of air. Okay? That's how we get that. We measure our air in cubic feet. We look at a fan, we say, how many cubic feet is that fan doing? A fan is a pump. It's an air pump. Okay? We can, we can visualize a water pump moving water. For some reason or another, we have a hard time understanding that a fan is moving the fluid to it. And it is. It's moving the fluid. It's just water. You can't see it. But it's doing work. I guarantee you it's doing work. Okay. There's some other things that we need to know when we're doing test and balance. We need to know how to use some other instrumentation. One of those instruments, you know, the reason we have to have different instruments is we used a a gauge like what's on a manifold gauge set that's in pounds per square inch, we would never even see any movement at all. So we have to have something that can move with very little changes in pressure. And one of those instruments is a magnahelion gauge. Okay, we're measuring inches of water column. How much pressure does it take to move the water up a, up a tube? That's what this is about. Okay, so it's measurement in inches of water. Okay, so when you look at that, there's some electronic instruments that are so much easier to use than those, such as this. Okay, 
And you can see the spaghetti, I like to call it the spaghetti, that we would have to set up with it also. Okay? That's just our lines that are attached for both static pressure measurements. I got one of them in here somewhere. I could use this if I don't point it into the air. That would be static. R. Help me out, John. What's it called? Pit top. Pit top two. Okay. Pit top two. The pit top two will measure both uh, air velocity, a total velocity, and static. I know you can't see this from where you're at, but there is some small holes in that tube right there. And then on the end, the part that actually points into the airstream as a whole here. Okay? I'm going to pass this around and look.